getting ready to start our last unit. Our last unit is called Simple Harmonic Motion and Waves. We're going to focus for the first couple of days on Simple Harmonic Motion, which we're going to define as motion in which the restoring force is proportional to the displacement. What does that mean exactly? Motion in which the restoring force is proportional to the displacement. Uh, well, this is a little proportionality sign, a little proportionality symbol. It means that as one thing changes, the other thing changes in the same way. The force is proportional to the displacement, x being the displacement. As x goes up, f will go up. As x goes down, f will go down. f is proportional to the displacement. Now, you guys haven't learned about proportionalities in math class yet, but if you had learned about them, you would learn that if f is proportional to the displacement, that it has to be equal to a constant something, some number, times the displacement. Well, we're going to say that it's equal to k times x. So simple harmonic motion really is f is equal to k times x, which we've learned about before back in our forces unit. It's called Hooke's Law. Hooke's Law describes for us simple harmonic motion, motion in which the restoring force is proportional to the displacement. So uh, let's give you an example here. You pull a spring back. You guys have all experienced this, right? You pull a spring back, pull it back a little bit, or compress it a little bit, and it requires a certain amount of force. But if you pull it back more and more and more and more and more, it requires more and more and more effort. It requires more force. So the further you pull the spring, or the, further, the more you compress the spring, the bigger the force required to do that. Therefore, the restoring force that wants to pull it back to where it came from, you pull a spring, okay, you apply the force. There's an equal and opposite restoring force that pulls it back to where it came from. That restoring force is also proportional to how far you pull it. You pull it further, it requires more force to pull it further, but it also pulls back with more force. Now, how's that simple harmonic motion? Motion that repeats itself. Well, if we let that spring go, then it would accelerate toward what we call its equilibrium position, its natural position. The spring would vibrate back and forth because it would accelerate towards its equilibrium position like this, go through its equilibrium position, slow down as the force became bigger because it was stretched or compressed on the other side, and then it would come back and accelerate back toward its equilibrium position, slow down on the other side, and so on. The motion would repeat itself because the force, the restoring force, would always be pulling it back toward the center, toward that equilibrium position. We define simple harmonic motion as motion in which the restoring force is proportional to the displacement. In other words, Hooke's law that we did back in unit two. But we think of it, we visualize simple harmonic motion quite simply as motion that repeats itself. For example, a vibrating spring would be simple harmonic motion. Because that's motion that repeats itself. That's motion in which the restoring force is proportional to the displacement. A pendulum is another example of simple harmonic motion. Now, a pendulum, when you look at my key is swinging on the end of this string here. That's a little bit harder to see how the force is proportional to the displacement, but it is. Okay, if I pull these keys further back, okay, we learned the other day that the period of the pendulum is the same no matter how far I pull them back within reason. Um, the period is the same, but the restoring force gets bigger. The force that pulls it back to its natural position, this position, gets bigger the further I pull it away. Makes sense, right? Pull it a little bit like this, doesn't require much force. The further you pull it away, the bigger the force required to, to pull it up. In other words, the bigger the restoring force pulling it back towards its equilibrium position. So the two common examples, the two most common examples that we'll look at are vibrating springs or elastics and the pendulum swinging back and forth. Frequency, we've already defined frequency back in our circular motion unit. We'll define it slightly differently this time. It was the number of revolutions per second or per unit time. 
This time we're just going to define it as the number of cycles per unit time. That's actually a better definition than we gave you back in our circular motion unit. The number of cycles per unit time includes revolutions, the number of revolutions per time. We're going to say frequency is equal to the number of cycles divided by the time. Whereas in our last unit, we said the number of revolutions divided by the time. Same thing, really. This equation, by the way, doesn't appear on your data sheet. Period. Is the time for one revolution? Shouldn't say that, actually. That was our last unit. We're going to say the time for one cycle. We can find a period, big T, by saying it's the time over the number of cycles. And we can also relate these two together by saying big T is equal to 1 over F. This one is on your data sheet. These two are not on your data sheet. This one is as well, by the way, Hooke's Law. I think we'll get an example pretty, pretty quick off the bat here, because really, we've done this stuff before, right? We've done Hooke's Law, F is equal to KX, back in our forces unit, and we've done the whole frequency and period thing in the last unit in the context of circular motion. So let's take a look at this one and see how easy this ends up being for us. It says, what's the frequency? Notice we're on Chapter 7, by the way, if you don't have that downloaded now. What's the frequency of an automobile engine in which the pistons oscillate with a period of 0 0.0625 seconds? There's another example of simple automatic motion. The pistons in an automobile engine going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, up and down. You don't see that, but it's happening. It's motion that repeats itself, and if you looked closer at it, it would be motion in which the force that pushes it back to its natural position is proportional to the displacement. In other words, um, how far away from the natural position those pistons are. The period here is 0 0.0625 seconds. I want to find the frequency. Man, this is probably about the easiest question you'll ever see in Physics 20. F is equal to 1 over T. 1 over 0 0.0625 gives me 16. What are the units for that? Three digits, 16.0 frequency. What is it? Hertz. Wow, this unit is easy, hey? Boy, let's just hope the rest of the unit is just as easy as this question is. Let's see what we can do with these two questions, guys. We'll give you just a couple minutes to do these, okay? All right, guys, let's take a look at number two here. A hummingbird, simple harmonic motion. Hey, motion that repeats itself. If you look closer at it, motion that, in which the, the force that brings the hummingbird's wings back to their natural position proportional to the displacement. Okay, simple harmonic motion. A hummingbird can hover when it flaps its wings with a frequency of 78 hertz, 78 cycles of this hummingbird's wings going up and down per second. Okay, that's that's flapping, the, flapping the wings a lot. 78 cycles per second. What's the period of the wing's motion? What are we going to do? Uh, divide by 60? No. T is equal to 1 over F, right? So 1 over 78, which gives us 0 0.013 seconds. Okay, we don't need to divide by 60 because Hertz is already cycles per second. And we're looking for a period in seconds. Yep. Seventy-eight. You mean on your calculator, like seventy-eight x to the minus one, like this? Yes. Um, but understand on, on on your calculator when you see that little function right there on your calculator, x to the minus one. What that means basically is one over whatever number you just typed in. So we're doing the same thing. We're just doing it slightly differently on our calculator. We're still taking the inverse of that 1 over 78. That rounds to 0 0.013, right? Good? All right. Those started off pretty good, eh?
let's take a look at the pendulum. We won't look too much more at the spring here because uh, the spring or the vibration of the spring and Hoke's law, because we already did that back in back in unit one or back in unit two with dynamics. Let's spend a little bit of time on the pendulum, though. We'll go back to that. We spent a, a couple minutes on it on Friday so that you could have the weekend to work on that, uh, that uh, part of your West Ed assignment. We'll spend a little bit more time on it today. Well, first define it. A pendulum is a, a device that consists of a string or a chain or a wire or something with a mass hanging on the end of it, that mass that we'll call a bob hanging on the end of it. And it swings back and forth, motion that repeats itself again, right? Motion in which the restoring force is proportional to the displacement? Yeah, pretty much. Simple harmonic motion, uh, sorry, uh, the pendulum isn't actually quite perfect simple harmonic motion because the restoring force isn't perfectly proportional to the displacement, but it's close. Close enough that at angles below about 45 degrees, it's a good example of simple harmonic motion. Now, the period of the pendulum, we talked about this on Friday for sure, is the time that it takes not for the pendulum bob to go from one side to the other, which is what a lot of people think. The period of the pendulum is the time that it takes to go from one side to the other and then back again. One complete to and fro motion. One complete cycle so that it's back to where it began. And then finally, we talked on Friday about what variables affect the period of the pendulum. We learned that, well, for the most part, the angle doesn't affect it. So if I've got the pendulum hanging like this, with a mass on the end of it, and I bring the pendulum up like this, or I bring the pendulum up like this, it doesn't really matter. The period of the pendulum is going to be the same. Now, that's only true to about 40 or 45 degrees. If you're above about 45 degrees, uh, that's not quite true. The angle does matter above about 45 degrees. But we won't see any questions where we're at an angle that's that big. So we're going to say that the angle doesn't matter, at least for us. Uh, you guys hypothesized on Friday that the mass of the pendulum mattered, the mass of the bob on the end of it. We found that it didn't matter. It didn't matter how heavy it was. If I put more keys on the end of my keys here and swing them back and forth like this, we saw that the period was exactly the same. Mass didn't matter. The angle didn't matter. What did matter? The length of the pendulum. How long this pendulum is. L. And gravity mattered as well. So if we take a pendulum to mark, we take a grandfather clock, which keeps its time based on a pendulum. We take that grandfather clock to the moon. It's not going to read the correct time because g is one-sixth of what it is on Earth. Therefore, the period of that pendulum as it's going back and forth will be dramatically different than it is on Earth. In fact, if you take a grandfather clock from Vancouver to Denver, Colorado, which is a mile high in the sky, 1.6 kilometers up. Okay. Calgary, we're about a kilometer up. Okay, Denver is about 1.6 kilometers up. Um, the gravitational acceleration in Denver is slightly less than it is in Vancouver. That would mean the period of the pendulum would be slightly different in, uh, in this, the uh, period of the same pendulum would be slightly different in Denver than it would be in Vancouver. That would mean that if you had a grandfather clock that was calibrated for Vancouver, it wouldn't keep the right time in Denver. It would have to be adjusted. It would have to be calibrated so that the length of the pendulum was the proper length to keep the proper time with a slightly smaller gravitational acceleration. So these are the only two factors that affect the period of a pendulum, L and G, the length of the pendulum and the gravitational field or the gravitational acceleration. Okay, not a crazy equation, but when we go to rearrange this, it becomes a little bit tricky sometimes. Let's, let's take a second and rearrange that equation. We start off, of course, with 2 pi square root L over G. What variables would we want to solve for? Well, maybe we want to solve for L. Okay, so let's do that. What goes over first? Want to solve for L, what goes over first? Yep. Good. How do you take the 2 pi over Ryan by, by dividing? Good. So it becomes T over 2 pi equals the square root L over G. Good, Ryan. Okay, what's next, guys? Lana, what's next here? How do you rearrange this to solve for L? Uh, 
multiply. No, not multiply by g yet, but you're close. Stephanie? You're going to square everything first here. So it's going to become t over 2 pi squared equals l over g. Now, Atlanta, what would I do to solve for l? Now I'm going to multiply it by g. Make sure you get rid of that square root sign first by squaring it, and then take it over and multiply it by g. So I end up getting l is equal to g times t over 2 pi squared. Solving for length, this is what it looks like. Don't memorize that. Understand how to rearrange that equation. You could very well see a question on a test that asks you to solve for length, but understand how to rearrange it. Okay, rearrange it each and every time, not memorizing it in your head. Okay, we want to solve for g. Want to get g by itself. Well, we're going to follow the same steps. Get l is equal to g over t over 2 pi squared. But now we've got to get rid of something to get g by itself. What do you want to get rid of? Yep. t over 2 pi squared. The whole thing, you mean? Yes, you can. Good. So we're going to take that over by dividing. It becomes g is equal to l over t over 2 pi squared. That's an awkward, ugly-looking equation, but it's valid. You could simplify it a little bit if you wanted to um, to get rid of that fraction on the bottom, but we're not going to worry about that because it, the mathematics of that becomes a little bit ugly. So We're going to leave it like that. we got three equations now. Really, just one, but three different forms of the same equation. This one, which appears on your data sheet. This one, which you can rearrange to find. And then this one, which you can rearrange the green one to find. That's it. You can't be asked for anything else. So if you can do these rearranging, then you should be good. Let's try this. What's the gravitational field strength, which is really the acceleration due to gravity, right? It's little g. At the top of Mount Everest, at the altitude of 8954 meters. Man, we said Calgary is a kilometer above sea level, a thousand meters above sea level. Denver, a mile high city, is 1.6 kilometers above sea level, 1,600 meters above sea level. The top of Mount Everest is nine kilometers, 9,000 meters above sea level. Believe it or not, if you climb Mount Everest, you've actually climbed. 136th of the way to the International Space Station. Like that's how high Mount Everest is. Climb Mount Everest 36 times, and you've just gone to the International Space Station. Okay. That's pretty high. We would expect the gravitational field strength to be higher or lower up there than it is here in Calgary or in Vancouver. Allie, what do you think? Is it going to be higher or lower? It could be lower. Okay, let's make a prediction here. How much lower? Okay, it's about 9.81-ish here. What do you think it's going to be at the top of Mount Everest? Is it going to be like 9.78? Is it going to be 9.70, 9.54? What do you think it's going to be at the top of Mount Everest? Just uh, an educated guess. 9.6, okay. Um, Tony, what do you think it's going to be? 9.2? Okay, let's see what it is. We've got a length of a pendulum of 1.00 meters, and we've got a period here of 2.01 seconds. The altitude is, is, is irrelevant to the question. Right? It's provided for context. We don't need that to calculate the gravitational field strength from our, from our uh, pendulum equation. T is equal to 2 pi square root L over G. Take the two, 2 pi over by dividing. Let's square everything. Let's take the g up by multiplying. Of course, they have to ask me for the one thing that's the hardest to solve for. Oh, well, get it out of the way right now. L over, take the t over 2 pi squared over by dividing. So it's 
L over T over 2 pi squared. L is 1.00 meters. T is 2.01 divided by 2 pi. Please, please, please follow along on, your, on the calculator here. Let's say, let's get the bottom number first. Okay, this looks, this looks pretty ugly, actually, if we do it, try to do it all at once on our calculator. Let's go 2.01 divided by bracket 2 pi, end bracket. Okay, there's the denominator. Let's square that. And then let's say 1 over that number. Gives me 9.77. So it's actually not that much less. The air is thinner at Mount Everest. It's way, way thinner at Mount Everest. Gravity is less at Mount Everest, but it's not that much less at the top of Mount Everest than it is here. You lose a little bit of weight when you go to the top of Mount Everest. Well, you lose a lot of weight probably when you go to the top of Mount Everest, but it's not because of the gravitational field. Okay, most of it's just because you got to work pretty hard to climb nine kilometers up in the air. Okay, let's have a look at these questions now. Same thing, but you might be solving for different variables, right? Okay, just remember the steps in rearranging. If you got any questions, let me know. All right, let's take a look at all of these questions at the request of some of you guys. Number one says, what's the gravitational field strength on Mercury if a 0.5 meter pendulum swings, uh, swings with a period of 2.3 seconds? In question number one, we have the length of the pendulum, uh, 0 0.500 meters. And the period of the pendulum is 2.30 seconds. We're looking for the gravitational field strength. Again, just like the example, we have to rearrange this equation. T is equal to 2 pi square root L over G. What do we get rid of first? Take it, what do we get rid of first here? Good. And we're going to do that by dividing. T over 2 pi equals square root L over G. What do we get rid of next? Kaylin. The square, right, the square root, so we're going to do that by squaring it. So t over 2 pi, square it, equals L over G. Good. What do we get rid of next? What do we do next here, Bart? Get rid of the L? We can't get rid of the L quite yet. Not quite yet. Um, what's next there, Derek? Yeah, take the G up by multiplying. Got to get the G on top here first. So it becomes G times t over 2 pi squared equals L. And now what are we going to do? Now what are we going to do, Jordan? I'm sorry? Divide the L, so take the L down like this. No. Multiply it, no. You're closer the first time. You're getting colder. Good, divide the T over 2 pi squared. So it becomes L over T over 2 pi squared. All right, so multiply 2 times pi. Get a number for it. T over that number. Get a number for it. Square it. Get a number for it. Then take L over that number. Get a number. And it should work out to be 3.73. We could say newtons per kilogram as they do here, or we could say meters per second squared. Either one of those works. All right? Who asked me for number one? I can't remember who that was. Number one? Okay. Are you okay with that? Okay, so let's plug the numbers in then. Okay, the big thing here is don't skip steps, right? Do it in, do it in lots of different steps on your calculator, and it should work out for us here. L is uh, 0 0.500 divided by 2.30 over 2 pi squared. So what's on our calculators? Get 2 times pi, get a number, 6.28, right? Say 2.3 over that, get 
get a number for it, square it, get a number for it, and then let's take 0.5 divided by that. And we get 3.73. Does that make sense? And of course, it's going to be downward because the gravitational field is always pointing downwards. Right? Question two. Pendulum swings with a period of five seconds on the moon. The gravitational field strength is 1.62. Um, somebody asked me a few minutes ago as you guys were working on the questions, do we need to make that negative? No. Okay, field strength is negative because it's a vector field, but when we plug it into this equation, we always just leave it as a positive value. We take the absolute value of it. So positive 1.62. What's the length of the pendulum? Once again, we're going to use that same equation, 2 pi square root L over G, but this time solve for L. T over 2 pi. Square it. Take the G up by multiplying, and it becomes G times T over 2 pi squared. Oops, uh, not 9.81, it should be 1.62. Okay, so for this one, let's get 2 pi. Let's get 2 pi first. Let's say 5 over that. Let's square that. And let's multiply it by 1.62. 1.03. I believe in your uh, swinging ship assignment for your West Ed project, uh, that's the first question, isn't it, where you have to find the length of the swinging ship. So basically, it's this question, right? Um, except the gravitational field strength would be not 1.62, but rather 9.81. And finally, question number three, what period would a 30-centimeter pendulum have on Mars where the gravitational field strength is 3.71 newtons per kilogram down? So the length of the pendulum would be 0 0.300 meters. The gravitational field is 3.71 newtons per kilogram or meters per second squared. This one's easier because we don't have to rearrange it. Let's get what's inside the square root sign first. Let's say 0.3 divided by 3.71. Let's square root that. And then let's multiply it by 2 times pi. And we get 1.79. Good? Any issues there? Who asked me for number three? Okay. Big thing in number three, right, is don't forget to convert from centimeters to meters there. Let's talk right now for the next few minutes about a phenomenon called resonance. How many people have heard that word before? In what context have you heard it? Like, where have you heard it before? Maybe you know what it means. Maybe you can explain it to me. Maybe you can't. It doesn't really matter right now. I'm just wondering where you've heard that word before, in what context. Yeah? Video games? Like a specific video game? Or? Okay. Like, what does that mean in the context of a video game? Okay. Okay. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Get a resonator pipe in the exhaust. Yeah, sure. So something happens inside this resonator pipe. From students last year? Okay, so they told you about it? Okay. Do you know what it means? Don't remember? Okay. Sound? You've heard it in the context of sound. Do you know what it means in the context of sound? Yeah, a vibration. Okay, I like that. Yeah, I like that term, vibration. 
Okay, it's not just any vibration. It's a pretty specific vibration, but you guys are getting closer to it here. Lots of good examples of it here. Okay. Uh, it can be, yes, sound-induced vibration. It absolutely can be. That would be an example of it. Um, so let's say the speakers, the speakers in your car cause something in your car to vibrate. Okay. Um, that can be resonance. Yep. Uh, by like a sonar type thing. So that, yeah, that wouldn't be a resonance. Wouldn't be a resonance thing. It's a good I good idea. I'm going to define it for you, and then I'm going to give you some examples, like you guys have just given me, but I'm going to explain those examples when I give them to you, okay? Resonance is the phenomenon, if I can spell this, a phenomenon whereby a force is applied on something. at the object's resonant frequency. What does that mean? The object's resonant frequency. Every object, every single thing, including molecules of water, like from car parts down to molecules of water, have a resonant frequency. A resonant frequency is the natural frequency at which something wants to vibrate. Right, Atlanta? Everything wants to vibrate. When I hit this desk, it vibrates. It has a natural frequency at which it wants to vibrate. What the sound that you heard corresponds to the frequency at which the desk wants to vibrate. Everything has a natural frequency at which it wants to vibrate. When you hit uh, your, your, your uh, orange juice cup in the morning with a spoon, you hear a sound. You hear a ting sound. It's vibrating at the natural frequency or the resonant frequency of the orange juice cup. When a speaker um, causes a window to start vibrating, okay, the window is vibrating at its natural or its resonant frequency. Everything has a natural or resonant frequency. When you apply a force on something at the object's natural frequency, it will cause that object to start vibrating. Now, if you apply that force enough, a strong enough force, or you apply it long enough, then the vibration can grow. Cause the object to start vibrating, And the vibration may grow, which means the vibration may get bigger and bigger and bigger. In other words, I hit a desk, it vibrates at its resonant frequency, it's done. But if I was able to match the resonant frequency, in other words, if I was able to hit with my hand that desk, at the same frequency as that sound was produced, which I couldn't because that sound is too high of a frequency for me to do it with my hand. But if I was able to match that, then that sound would grow. It would get louder and louder and louder and louder. The vibration grows if you match the resonant frequency with the force that you're applying. That's resonance. Where's an example of that? Okay, where's an example of that? Nobody gave me this one. I was thinking somebody might. When the opera singer sings at this really high pitch, this really loud voice, what happens sometimes? The glass breaks. Why? 
if she can match the resonant frequency of the glass, then she'll cause the glass to start vibrating, right? But if she sustains that force that she's applying with her voice for a certain amount of time, and it's a loud enough sound, then the vibration of the glass grows and grows and grows. And at some point, the glass can't handle that vibration anymore, and what happens to it? It breaks. Have you guys ever heard of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge? Place Tacoma, Washington. I believe it was in the 50s, I think. I can't remember the exact time frame here. Yeah. Yeah. A bridge that was up for maybe six months collapsed. A suspension bridge over this canyon collapsed. And it did it because, well, for there's a number of factors involved, but one of them was resonance. It wasn't a very well-designed bridge. It has a natural frequency. The same as every bridge has a natural frequency at which it wants to vibrate. But one day, the wind is blowing. Well, it's a strong wind, but it's not a wind that should blow down a bridge. Right? It didn't blow down anybody's house. If it didn't blow down a house, it shouldn't blow down a concrete and steel bridge, right? But the wind is gusting, and it's gusting at just the right rate. So the resonant frequency of the bridge was matched by the, by the frequency of the wind gusting. Not the strength of the wind gusting, but the frequency at which it was gusting. That caused the bridge to vibrate. It caused the bridge to vibrate more and more and more because the force was being applied on that bridge at the bridge's resonant frequency. The disturbance grew. The vibration grew and grew and grew and grew. And just like the glass cup that the opera singer sings breaks, the bridge broke too. The bridge collapsed. Not because it was a strong wind, but because the wind was was blowing with a certain frequency. Does that make sense? I'll show you a video of that in a second because, believe it or not, even though it was in the 50s, it was actually caught on video. They, I mean, everything's caught on video now, right? But back in the 50s, stuff like that didn't get caught on video. But this one just happened to, somebody just happened to have some primitive video camera that actually caught it. How many people, we'll go back to that, show you that video in a second here. How many people have, have walked across the pedestrian bridge by the library in Okotoks. How many people have done that? Most of you probably have, eh? Your hands up high if you have. You ever notice, those of you who have, that if you jump up and down on that bridge, that the bridge starts vibrating? The bridge starts bouncing up and down, up and down. Do you ever, in your, in your mind, think, like, hey, if I jump up and down at the right time, I can cause that vibration to get bigger. Do you ever in the back of your mind have that thought? You don't have to understand, well, I shouldn't say that. You don't have to know about resonance to have that thought. You don't. Intuitively, when we're on a situation like that, we know if we jump up and down at the right time, then we're going to cause our disturbance to grow. We're going to cause the vibration to grow, right, Seth? Put it away, please. That's resonance. You have an intuitive understanding of resonance just by observing it. Okay? Now we can define it, though, and now we can explain it. When you jump up and down at just the right time, that bridge uh, down by the library in Okotoks will vibrate more and more and more and more. But that bridge isn't a poorly designed bridge because you can't, <clears throat> the resonant frequency of that bridge, if you ever notice this, it's too low. You can't jump up and down at the right frequency. You can't match that frequency. So you can cause it to vibrate by jumping up and down. You can cause it to vibrate at its resonant frequency, but you're not going to cause resonance where the disturbance grows and grows and grows because you can't match the resonant frequency. You can't apply your force at the resonant frequency. By the time you jump up and back down, one cycle of the bridge's resonant frequency hasn't completed. Okay? 